Good morning. Grace and peace be to each of you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful fall morning, and it is so wonderful to be together in God's house on this day. A few reminders as we get started. After worship today, you're invited to go upstairs to the fellowship hall. There's a fellowship meal for us together, barbecue and all the sides, and it'll be a chance to really just spend time with one another and enjoy one another's company. Of course, if you need to pick up your meal and take it with you, that's understandable as well, but hope that you'll be able to stay for that. Next week as well, we'll be celebrating All Saints here at First United Methodist Church, and after the service, we're having a catered meal um, by the Lucy Little family, and all are invited to come and join in that time of remembering the saints and fellowship with one another. So mark your calendars for next week as well. But this is the day the Lord has made, and we're invited to rejoice in it. Let us stand together and join in the call to worship. We hear the voice of God calling. Love your neighbor as yourself. We feel the Spirit moving among us. Moving us to acts of compassion and justice. We know the love of Jesus. We love because Christ first loved us. Come, worship God together. Come. remain standing for the Apostles' Creed, found on page 881 of your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
The Psalter today is Psalm 146, verses 1 through 10, and this can be found on page 858. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Put not your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. Happy are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord watches over the sojourners. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, from generation to generation. You're invited to be seated as the children come forward for children's time. <laughs> Good morning. Have you all already had a chance to do some trick-or-treating and get some candy? I know I saw you yesterday. Have you all gotten a chance to do some trick-or-treating? How does it feel to get free candy wherever you walk around? Um, I table. You what? By table, by table. You take you get you go table by table, yeah. How's it feel? It feels good, right? It feels good when we are loved and we get gifts, right? Feels good when we are loved and we get gifts. And Halloween's an example of that. We get lots of candy. That means everybody in the community loves us. God gives us a bunch of gifts too. God gives us love and life and help and our church family, our family that we live with, and the way that leads to a good life. So there's a lot of things that God gives us that make us feel good too. Yeah, thank you. Um, yesterday we had a few um, children related to the church that got to actually help hand out candy after they went around yesterday and got candy. And they were really excited. They seemed almost as excited to help give out candy to other kids as they were to receive it. Are you all going to be at home tonight and help give out candy? No. Or are you going to go trick-or-treating some more? 
Yeah. Whether you go out trick-or-treating or you're at home, you can remember the main point of our passage today from the Gospel of Mark. It says to love God and love neighbor. We're supposed to do both. We can love God by coming to church and being in worship, by praying, by reading scripture, and we also show our love by giving to others, by giving to others. So it feels good to give candy, but it also feels good to receive it. Which one do you like better, Grayson? Twizzlers or Skittles? Skittles? What about you, Madeline? Skittles? What about you, Tyson? Twizzlers. Now, you all got different candy based on what you like better, and that's love. Love loves us who we are, loves who we are, loves our preferences, and gives us what's best for us. That's what God does for us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. If you're, if you're good, maybe an adult around you will help you open it so you can snack on it a little bit. Too. But it's also really fun to give out candy. So I'm going to give you another one for you to give to somebody else, okay? We're invited to love God, to give God thanks for all the gifts God gives us that taste good and make life fun, but we also get to be part of giving that love to other people, loving our neighbor. And you know what? That's just as important for us to do both. So let us pray, and then I'll let you give a lucky adult some candy. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you not only love us and give us life and good things, but that you give us a community that loves us and we can share love with as well. All this we pray through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Be sure to give one away.
Our gospel lesson comes to us from Mark in the 12th chapter, verses 28 through 34. Listen with me for God's word. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said he is one and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared ask him any question. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill our hearts with understanding and with love. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. We all know civil discourse is a hard thing to come by these days. When I have hard conversations with somebody or about an important topic, it usually ends up being with somebody who shares my mindset or people who share with me and who don't know my own perspective. It's rare to find people who are willing to talk about hard things without them having an ulterior motive and where they're secure in their own position enough that they can be open to hear what another person has to say. I wonder when was the last time you had a conversation like that? Who was it with and what was it about? In the Gospel of Mark, before Jesus' passion, Jesus is in the temple teaching. It seems to be sort of like a game show. One person comes after him after another. One group pops up to have a showdown with Jesus, like the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, and when they go away, another pops back up, another round in the debate with Jesus. They've debated things like, where does authority come from and who has it? They've asked hard questions about resurrection and the life to come, about divorce and taxes and the role of government. Jesus has discussion about all those hot button topics that we don't really want anyone to touch, particularly not our pastor and particularly not church. Money, sex, taxes, politics. Here Jesus is discussing them all. This account in Mark is right after all that debate has happened and a scribe comes forward This one is a little bit different. It's a little different than the debate that's come right before. This doesn't seem to be a test of Jesus anymore, but instead an invitation to that mutual debate, that honest discourse that's so rare for Jesus and for us. Jesus is also unguarded and direct with this questioner as well. We're not sure which tradition this scribe comes from, but he is part of temple life and he's an intimate part of everyday life. But it's really remarkable that Jesus talks to him at all. Scribes have been denouncing Jesus from the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark. And it's really, really striking that Jesus receives his honest question and recognizes it for what it is. It's remarkable that the scribe hears the heart of what Jesus is saying despite their differences and how he's answering. 
So Jesus engages with this man in his honest question. Jesus seems to be able to use a process we might call appreciative inquiry these days. You know, part of what makes conversation so hard is we have different centers in our brain. Right at the base of our skull, we have what's called sometimes the reptilian brain. It's sort of our baser instincts. We get angry and hot and upset, and you can kind of feel it run down the back of your neck, right? That heat, that anger, that flush that goes through your whole body. When that gets activated, this frontal part of your brain, this frontal lobe, the part for critical thinking, it gets shut down. This is ruling the day. We get hot and bothered, and we're going to stay hot and bothered unless we cool off. When we use appreciative inquiry, we are activating this frontal lobe of our brain that acts, asks us to be critical and appreciative and approach things with curiosity. We're very mindful of the questions we ask one another, and we're directing them toward a positive outcome. It's a posture of curiosity. It enables us to approach one another with wonder, with appreciation for what somebody else has said, hearing them honestly in their words and their perspective without needing to quickly respond from our own. The scribes asked Jesus, which commandment is the most important? Which commandment is the most important? He asked this partially because not only are there 10 commandments, but there's a whole slew of laws and regulations that come in the beginning portion of scripture that tell us how to live life together. Maybe something else should rise to the top, and he's asking Jesus from a genuine place of curiosity. He's, he's using that front part of his brain and his heart. Jesus responds, the first is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. The scribe seems to be in this mode too. He, he responds with appreciative inquiry. Wow, Jesus, you're right. That sounds great. He reflects back what he's heard, and he puts it in his own words. He, he echoes back to Jesus what he's just heard. A wonderful answer, teacher. So clear-cut and accurate that God is one and there is no other. And loving him with all passion and intelligence and en energy and loving others as well as you love yourself. Why, that's better than all the offerings and sacrifices put together. If you've ever been in church, you've heard things like, they'll know we are Christians by our love, or God is love, or we're just going to love on people. Okay. Even our first hymn this morning said, and own that love is heaven. We, we use this word love a lot in church. There was a husband and a wife playing chess together. The wife makes a devastating move which disrupts the defenses of the husband's side of the board. And as she sees the look on his face, she grabs his arms and says, I love you, you know. And his response is, I've heard that before. You've, you've heard love before, but, but I wonder if you can define it. Is it a feeling? Is it an action? Is it a choice? Is it something beyond us? Does it go in one direction or must it be in two? Is love a noun or a verb? Is the opposite of love hate or is it apathy? What do you think? When we think about the law in scripture that these two men are debating about, 
we often think of it like a fence or like walls. These, these are hard boundaries and they, they fence us in. And sometimes that can feel frustrating that these hard boundaries are in place that cannot be moved. But the invitation this morning, especially on Halloween, is to instead think of it like a skeleton. We need structure in our body to be able to move and to live. If we didn't have bones, we'd be a puddle of goo on the floor. Our skeleton is so important. Love puts flesh on the skeleton that is the law. With our muscles and our skin holding us in and on our bones, why we can jump, we can, we can dance, we can, we can run around and, and we can hug one another. The first commandment in that table of Ten Commandments, you can find it in Deuteronomy chapter 5 or in Exodus 20. But either place, the first commandment is, there are no other gods before me. I am the Lord your God. There's a boundary there, a limit. But Jesus puts flesh on those bones. He says it in a positive frame. If you flip from the Ten Commandments in chapter 5 in Deuteronomy to the next page in chapter 6, you'll hear what Jesus has replied. It's called the Great Shema. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. There's a boundary, and then there's flesh put on those bones. If we only follow those first four commandments of the ten, the loving God commandments, we only half follow them. The second half of the commandments are things like don't murder, don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, don't become obsessed with what others have that you don't. Jesus goes a step beyond the scribe's question and again puts flesh on those bones. Jesus frames it positively and he sums all of those six commandments up using Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If our image here is, is a body, not, not a fence, our bodies still have structure and still have boundaries. But it's not the kind that hems us in and prevents life. It's the kind that creates it. And this body is for, is for giving it one another a hug a handshake, a smile, and a direct look in your eye. It's, it's, not for, it's not for a punch. There are boundaries to the law and to love. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you'll see another positive frame of this. Instead of all those things we're not supposed to do, to love your neighbor as yourself, you'll find things like love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude, it does not insist on its own way, it's not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Probably not for you, but uh, opposite of that pops in my head, right? The, the negative portion, what not to do, in frame of what to do. And that's that song that you get rickrolled by. Never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down, never gonna turn around and search you, never gonna make you cry, never gonna say goodbye, never gonna tell a lie and hurt you. There's boundaries, <laughs> but there's flesh and power. 1 Corinthians 13 is 
often read at weddings, but this is about love. God's love, primarily. And we learn to love because God first loves us. We love others because God loves us and shows us what that looks like. All of our relationships are subject to this love and this invitation. Our friendships, our blood kin, our neighbors down the street, those we avoid and those we hate and refuse to enter a debate with. Those are the people we're to love and we're to love with those characteristics from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The goal of our faith is to love as God loves us. God loves us into existence. None of us is an accident or a mistake. God loved you into this earth. And then God breathes love on us. God remains steadfast when we fail. God shows us what love looks like so that we can practice loving God and loving one another. Sharing with others and with God that love first given to us. God loves us all the way to the point of death and beyond. God never compromises that goal of our restoration, of abundant life for us, always giving us the option and opportunity to share in that love as well. Part of what it means to be creature and human and not God is that we run into one another's boundaries all the time. Love is messy, and love is disorderly, and love is vulnerable. Love brings grief, especially when we lose one that we love so dearly, and it brings great joy. But love has boundaries, too. Sometimes we get in unhealthy relationships, and, and those boundaries kind of fall or disappear or get muddy. We, we can't say no when we need to. We're afraid of rejection and abandonment. But a healthy way of loving and being boundaried is to be able to say no or yes when you need to. And we can handle receiving a no because the greater yes is in the relationship. An unhealthy identity is about when we think about what others want us to be. A healthy boundary is knowing who we are and whose we are and respecting ourselves. An unhealthy way of being is to take others' problems and make them our own, and, and whether we're asked to or not, we try to get in there and fix them for others. A healthy way, a positive way of showing love is to know when problems are ours, and it's our work to do, and when it's somebody else's to do. We have a tendency as humans to either be overly responsible for what's happening in somebody else's life or, or we end up being passive or dependent on others to do that for us. Love invites us to step into a different reality, to share responsibility and power and love in all our relationships, whether those are friendships or family or coworkers or a neighbor down the street. There's a positive reality, but a boundaried one. And a lot of us are so good at giving help to other people that we, we can't ask for it or accept it when we need it. Love doesn't let us down. <laughs> Love never fails. Love invites us into mutuality with one another. I think a beautiful, beautiful example of this, putting flesh on love, comes from Eleanor Pesci and Chuck Kaiser out at Meadowview. Both are church members and, and are just delightful people. 
When I visited with them last, they were telling me about their friend, Mabel. Mabel has had a stroke a long time ago. She's really not able to say many words. She, um, she can kind of grunt and point to indicate what she needs, um, but she's only got two names. She's got a female name and a male name. If you're male, you get called that name. If you're female, you get called the female name. She's, she's really not able to express herself fully and get around the way that she wants to. There are a lot of reasons why Chuck and Eleanor might choose not to interact with Mabel. You know, they've got a big dining room, but with COVID restrictions, there's only two people at a table. So, you know, there's a lot of people to visit with. It, it'd be nice to have somebody to have conversation with over a meal. You know, it's, it's frustrating when somebody can't fully express their wants and their needs to you or carry on a conversation, or, or even ask how your day was. And I know it's frustrating to understand what she's saying. But Eleanor and Chuck, they've made it their mission to embrace Mabel. They've made it their mission. They include her. Chuck is always joking with her and picking at her in a way that's loving. And they love her. Eleanor always sits with Mabel, the two of them at a table, every meal to share that time together. What an outpouring of love. What a way to put flesh on those bones. And every once in a while, Mabel is able to get out their real name because she knows the flesh they've put on those bones. You know, love... Love isn't easy. Love is hard. Love wells up in our hearts a gift from our Heavenly Father. But it's not just for us. It's supposed to well up and out and share with others. Love is a choice to participate in the word, world, work of God in the world. Loving one another until all know love's true embrace. May it be so. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As we turn to the Lord in prayer, we've got lots of opportunities to embrace our community with the arms of love. Uh, Alice Reinhardt's daughter was in a motorcycle accident, and so we want to surround Alice and her family in care. Also this week, um, Elwood Green passed away yesterday, and so we surround Vicki and Kelly and all who loved him with support. Also, the family of Dot Huntley, we want to surround with love and support after her passing as well. And Lonnie Bauckham is at Monroe Hospital uh, in, in a tough spot, so we surround Lonnie and all of his family. We love all these people so dearly, and it's our chance to surround them in love, prayer, signs of acts, uh, signs and acts of love and comfort. Let us pray. O oh God, you have been faithful, yet we have not always loved you with our whole heart. You showed us how to love our fellow human beings, yet we have not always loved our neighbor as ourself. Turn us back to you, O God, that we may follow your commandment of love. We pray for the health and vitality of the church. You command us to honor you by loving one another, yet all too often there's quarreling and jealousy among us. Help us to live your law of love as we seek to grow into the full stature of Christ. We pray for the welfare of the world. You have blessed us with every skill and gift for nurturing the common good. Yet our self-centered ways incline our hearts toward evil. Strengthen us to work together for the mutual benefit of neighbors near and far and for the life and prosperity of your reign on earth. 
We pray for the well-being of your creation. Our choices wreak havoc on the world you have made and put your planet in peril. Guide our patterns of consumption for the flourishing of all creation and for all the generations yet to come. We pray for all who suffer and are in need. You call us to care for one another with compassion and steadfast love, yet we wither in the face of anguish and brokenness. Equip us for the work of reconciliation, that we might offer hope and healing in the power of your name. We pray for all who are sick and dying. May your will for them be fulfilled. Fill us with your mercy and kindness that we may care for them with loving hearts as you bring them into the wholeness of your peace. We commend all life to you, O God, knowing that you hear our prayers and you answer them according to your will, through Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. As Christ has given himself for us, let us, in turn, give ourselves for others. We invite the ushers to come forward.
bless these gifts, O Lord, from your unfailing care for your people. Let them be a sign of our gladness for all that we have and all that we may offer to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, God shows us love so that we might show love to others. And it's a resource that never runs dry. So let us do that abundantly. Go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to embrace the world. Amen. <laughs> 